Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Geospatial Forum. It is a real pleasure to have Dr. Xiaowen Wang here with us today. Xiaowen is a professor in the Department of Geography at the University of Illinois. Uh, and he's also currently the president of the University Consortium of GI Science, probably the most important body of academics uh, guiding frontiers and principles in the uh, in GIS, geospatial sciences, et cetera. So it's a, it's a real pleasure to have him here. He's at the, at the helm, leading our, our discipline in a number of ways. Uh, Shaolin is also the director of the Center for Cyber GIS and Advanced Spatial Studies. I say that right? Close. <laughs> the Cyber GIS Center. It's on the screen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Digital and spatial studies, yes. Yeah. Which has been a really big hit at the University of Illinois. Anybody in this area has heard about all the fabulous things he's done. He's had big support from the National Science Foundation for this, as well as from his university, seeing the importance of it. Uh, he received his PhD from the uh, and master's degree from the University of Iowa, and put together a really interesting combination of studies both in computer science and geography, um, which I, I think is very uh, unique, um, which has uh, made him very talented and um, just a great combination that we, I think we can see more and more of. Um, and uh, from there, I guess he's going to be sharing this cool work that he's been doing at Illinois and beyond. So thanks. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Ross. Um, it's a pretty pleasure to be here and uh, appreciate your kind introduction and uh, humbling me along the way. Um, so I'm going to be talking about synergistically advancing CyberGS and geospatial data science, as you uh, see from the beginning slide. Uh, what I was thinking to do is to really uh, get across four tiers of knowledge domains, uh, starting from the top computation and data intensive sciences and applications, uh, and uh, from top to bottom, uh, getting to the geospatial data science and uh, bottom to up uh, from advanced computing, uh, cyber infrastructure to uh, cyber GIS. I'll converge in the middle largely settled on the advances of cyber GIS. And the, the right hand you see from this slide are some of the highlights of examples I'm going to use to correspond to those four knowledge domains on the left hand. Well, let's... Um, perhaps set, sort of reserve our uh, thoughts a little bit, uh, review what has been, for instance, uh, the primary approaches to science. Experiment observation and theory have been there for decades, right, as we uh, review the evolution of sciences. Only until, say, about uh, 50, 60 years ago, computation really developed. And the computational science itself has become a major approach to science, you know, numerical methods and analytics. And only, say, a few decades ago, big data showed up, data-driven discoveries. So you could say just in the past 50, 60 years, I would argue we experienced some disruption in the evolution of science and technologies. So now we see these interactions across the board, not only just experiment theory, observation, but big data and computation altogether. So what this means to geospatial sciences and technologies and applications? Well, let's look at geospatial big data. I always have the color of my glasses. I'm biased. You know, I'm loving geospatial stuff. My argument to all the broad big data communities, geospatial big data is the most exciting and challenging big data we are facing. You know, for however many Vs you could have come up with, we have it, geospatial big data. Not just volume, variety, veracity, value, at all. If you want to be creative about just making up bus terms along those Vs other people have done geospatial data have all of them. But if we look critically at what geospatial big data are all about is these kinds of characteristics. I'm not going to enumerate it through, but you clearly see the heterogeneity and the 
diversity, the access part, distributed access, also the production of the data is so massive. Each of us is producing geospatial big data every day. You might have noticed from the pockets and the devices you have, the sensors you carry. So thinking of this backdrop of the major change from the science and technologies and also from the geospatial big data, the question is why cyber GIS? We saw GIS was largely created for the purpose of cartographic mapping. This is how GIS was developed initially. But now a lot of other purposes have been imposed on GIS, such as these examples I listed. Design, I learned very compelling examples today while touring the lab here. You're designing things, right? You're using geospatial tools and technology and sciences to be design things. This is not originally how GIS was created for. And scientific problem solving increasingly is dependent on GIS. But if you think of GIS, the toolboxes, the capabilities, those were not created for scientific problem solving necessarily. So there is a mismatch. But also, if you look at, in general, the geospatial science and technologies, we are increasingly interested in not only in patterns, which GIS has offered an effective approach to for a number of years and the multiple decades. Now we're increasingly interested in the understanding of processes, the dynamics, right? What's driving the changes of patterns? And also the combination of quantitative and qualitative data information. And increasingly, the data has temporal elements on top of the spatial elements. As I'm moving, I'm collecting data. All the spatial data I have have temporal stamps. So it's spatial and temporal. And we used to be very rigorous about the measurements of space. But more recently, there is needs for understanding place. And the place, when I understand, say, Raleigh, North Carolina State I'm visiting, which is very different from each of your understanding about Raleigh. So this is the notion of vagueness of place. It's not about how precise I'm having measurements from my device, but rather how we perceive our environment as the knowledge we construct for our places. So if we want to represent all of the above through the evolution of GIS, I would argue the conventional GIS approaches are likely outdated. So this is a pushing for the new development, the future GIS, which in general we refer to as cyber GIS. It's dependent on advanced computing and advances of cyber infrastructure. And it's about geospatial information science and the systems. If uh, I my sample from, say, the last decade, again, it's biased view here, the literature space, you clearly see this has gone for, uh, for a number of years in terms of what the literature has looked into in terms of the development of cyber GIS. Now, if you look at popular information like uh, Wikipedia, cyber GIS is perceived as an interdisciplinary field, combining advanced computing, cyber infrastructure, GI science and technology and spatial analysis modeling and a variety of geospatial domains. But the focus is on computational and the data intensive geospatial problem solving, which were those two new disruptive dimensions only <coughs> happened for over half a century. Now we need to embrace and we need to take on. Now coming back to my outline, give you some examples of computation data intensive uh, sciences and applications. One example I learned I thought would be matching to your interest, especially the wonderful progress made here on terrain analysis and modeling. For instance, here USGS Geological Survey has this uh, very ambitious program called the 3DAP, three-dimensional elevation program, which is across the country going to derive LIDAR-based terrain data sets, topographic data sets. Uh, there are multiple levels of uh, measurements uh, for the middle tier in terms of the accuracy level two data set. It has uh, 
vertically about nine centimeters resolution, and the per square meter you have six centimeters, even better. And the per square meter you have multiple points coverage, two points. So do you know the total data amount for this entire production if it's finished? Uh, I know that 40 counties eastern North Carolina had 240.5 billion points. So in terms of data volume, do you have a sense, meaning, say, terabytes, hundreds of? Depends on whether you compress it or not. <laughs> so the raw data, even if you compress, this is tens of petabytes. And for those of you who are modeling terrains, do the physical models or other models, the current generation, as some of you know, is called national elevation data. Uh, that is one-third arc, 10-meter resolution. That is only below half terabyte for the raw data. Now we're talking about even data volume alone. This is thousands, tens of thousands increase. So for those of us who are currently using such data sets for our scientific purposes, we still sometimes have had a hard time to deal with the access. But generally, we're able to piece together our puzzles. Now you imagine this much coverage with this level of details and with this data volume. The question is how you even imagine the access be made to individual users and the scientists to access this mountain of data. And remember, this is not a single scan. Even the current AED is not a single scan. It's updated. Not every week, but once every while, it's updated. So the question is, uh, how do we imagine a digital environment for having access to such topographic data sets for each of us that could be easily available? So we have an ongoing project. It's called TopoLens that is aiming to achieve that. The idea is, is you put this data in high-end cloud computing environment, and you create interfaces that are shielding the complexity of computing and the usually the GIS savvy workflows from end users. And you allow users to focus on the data products they want to work with. And this is meant to be interactive. And I'll give you an example to see what is this interactivity, if I could. Move this thing. So this is a related application behind topo lanes, the analytical workflows. And this is on the web. It's called a CyberGIS Gateway. I'll demystify how this works later. But uh, if you want to register, you could go to gateway.cybergis.org to register yourself to be able to access this application. And for this demo, it's based on the current NED, the National Elevation Data Set, which is uh, still below half terabyte, uh, but it's uh, hosted in a computing environment called Roger, I will tell you. There are multiple options. The first option is the NED data set, but uh, there's also another option called Open Topography, which is an NSF-funded data facility using LiDAR-derived data. Now you could go to any part, lower 48 states, for the NED data, you select a particular zone. And any parts you want to select, you could tweak the scope of the zones. And then you would specify the data products you want to derive. Again, these are detailed workflows, not meant to be useful for just a general public. These are for users who are familiar with topographic analysis and hydrology analysis. And as you select specific data products, you would be able to see the workflow components could be highlighted. Uh, for instance, uh, this shows uh, hydrologically conditioned and the pit removed, if you are familiar with terrain analysis. As you are working through the data products you want to derive, StreamNet, just as shown, you need to also provide some parameters. This is all happening online. And it's a multi-user environment, meaning you could access to this environment as I am. We could do this simultaneously. And your environment might be looking pretty different than mine, but it's all controlling the same workflow. And the workflows executed 
not on the web server, but on remote computing environments. And it's a multi-disciplinary uh, environment allows different experts of different domains to use a Wikipedia type of system to annotate the workflows and data products. And now, if you're happy with your configurations of your workflows, you submit your analysis. Your analysis goes to remote computing resources. We're currently using the National Science Foundation cyber infrastructure environment that connects a number of supercomputing big data centers together, allows these resources to be shared. Now, once the analysis is committed, it will not be automatically executed immediately. It needs to go to the resources and match the data with the computing and usually gets users to wait for between a few minutes to maybe half an hour. But you could do any other things simultaneously in this environment, derive other data products. And once your results are available, you get notif notifications. So this is a stream network derived uh, out of uh, the 10 meter resolution DEM for the part we selected on the nor northeast side of, of the US. You could uh, commit as many analysis as you want based on your interest and your configurations of the parameters you need to examine. And once your data sets are available like this, getting visualized, you could also download your data. You could uh, tweet your link uh, to the data if you want to share with other people. And the workflow, very quickly shown briefly, is also preserved. So next time, if another user want to look at your analysis, they could start from the same workflow, refine that workflow as opposed to a fresh start. So this allows for what we argue to be reproducible digital science. So this collaborative work with the NSF HydroShare project, if uh, you're from the hydrology community, you might be familiar with that project. Uh, a spe specific analysis is related to that data, turning data analysis is this uh, continental scale flood inundation mapping, which is a collaboration with the National Water Center and also multiple hydrology research groups across the country. The leading one is uh, the group uh, by, uh, led by David Maidman at UT Austin. So his work is to um, characterize the topographic variations, again, hope to be at a highly detailed uh, level and uh, map the contributions of these topographic features to the flood potential. And surprising to me, uh, this has not been done at this scale in the past, but uh, very quickly in this collaboration, we discovered it's very challenging to do at a larger scale, to associate the contributions of topographic variations to the flood potential. And this uh, initially the workflow we had to assemble together took weeks to complete on a supercomputer. Now we are able to shrink that to a few hours. Now the National Water Center hope to make this as an operationalized piece of their operation in the future, just like we would pursue the weather prediction. In the future, we would pursue the, the flood prediction as a, as a forecast you would get currently for the weather, like the precipitation movement. Uh, so as a close colleague, uh, David Maidman gave a keynote a couple of years at one of the CyberGS community meetings. To, this is what he said. I really like what he said. I always show off to NSF, say, hey, you know, this is a, what a hydrology uh, expert uh, is, uh, is claiming and is telling the communities, uh, you know, we should uh, pursue the same kind of work, uh, maybe uh, even relevant to some other science problems. So what this means, the examples I showed you uh, from the computation data intensive uh, sciences and applications is uh, now we are facing this extreme scale geospatial computing data and the communication systems. That's what's behind the scene making all this happen. And this gets us to the data, geospatial data science, uh, which I want to share with you the scope of geospatial data science is really this uh, intersection between geospatial sciences technologies, mathematical statistical sciences, you know, machine learning and the nice work uh, progress made linking to the computational cyber infrastructure side 
in the recent years, uh, particularly deep learning, uh, artificial intelligence. But the centerpiece, of course, to the geospatial community is this, uh, you know, big data and the cyber GIS, uh, which we are pushing. But uh, let me ask and pose a fundamental question to you as we are resolving such uh, big data challenges. As we know, and your center is engaging very extensive computing research, for computer science, a common question gets asked is what is the nature of computational complexity? In fact, that is a cornerstone of computational uh, computer science uh, progress made in the early days of computer science. But the question I'm posing to you is what is the nature of computational intensity of spatial analysis and modeling in the context of big data? Computational complexity theory, in fact, does not answer the questions of computational intensity, which is the estimate of cost of computation. So here's a concrete example, but a very simple example. That is, if you have a large data set, which is a skewered <coughs> measurement distribution on the left hand, and you want to perform, for instance, spatial interpolation against this data set, which is likely going to be dependent on nearest neighbor search because your spatial interpolation is going to take into account of the neighbors, see the contributions, for instance, my value is dependent or correlated to the values from Ross and others closer to me, right? So you need to search your nearest neighbors. As we know, more densely measured zones, the cost of searching out your neighbors is relatively lower compared to the areas that are not having dense measurements because you need to search more to identify your closest neighbors. Making sense? Yeah. So a spatial search process combined with spatial data distributions allow us to estimate computational cost, whereas computational complexity theory completely throws out this spatial distributional characteristics. It's only as if you're, if you're familiar with computational complexity formulations, it only considers n as the size of the problem domain. It doesn't consider the characteristics of our spatial domains. So my argument is in order to get a good handle of this computational intensity question, you need to bring back the spatial knowledge to estimate your computational intensity. Why is it important? You look at the examples, the computation I executed, it's not on your local computers. It's on Amazon, it's on big computers. In order for you to commit your analysis to those resources, it's better for you to first have a good handle of the computational cost associated to that. You don't want to submit analysis to bring down Amazon infrastructure, right? You will be bankrupt. <laughs> So it's the notion of divide and conquer. <coughs> and you want to know spatially explicit representation of your, of your computational intensity. And based on that, you want to divide your spatial domain into parts that are going to be matched <coughs> to your available computational resources. Could be integrated as a single cluster supercomputing environment. Could be also distributed across multiple sites as distributed computing resources. But this is not an easy problem. To partition a big spatial problem associated to big data into smaller parts matched to computational environments turn out to be a hard problem. It's a spatial partitioning problem with multi-criteria. And there are two just summarized for you to look at quickly here. But the basic idea is you want to use your computational resources efficiently, and at the same time, you want to minimize the coordination of the smaller parts you partitioned. But uh, the granularity of those parts is really a hard decision variable to reach to the best optimality. So if you are smart graduate students, you want to get into this hard problem, read on and it's demanding some creative solutions. You could develop heuristics, but uh, the solutions could be a broad range. 
So this is the notion, as I argued, we're really looking at both spatial domains and computational domains. And the spatial domains, I used spatial distribution as an example to show you that knowledge is important to determine the computational intensity. But computationally, as we know, it's complexity versus intensity, as I was using the computational complexity theory as an example, but uncertainty versus validity. And performance versus reliability, how fast you want to get your results versus how reliable the results are to you. A few days ago, Amazon was down. down. Anyone notice that? Yeah. <laughs> ArcGIS Align was down. ArcGIS Align was down. Uh, so I have a, a CyberGIS supercomputer. We actually was using that in the classrooms. We told the students, see how CyberGIS computing is reliable <laughs> in the days of, uh, of Amazon was not and ArcGIS Online was not. But anyway, so uh, the point here is if you want to approach complex problems at a scale, both spatially and computationally, we really are at a point to have to think synergistically across these two knowledge domains. A lot of innovation has to happen, as I hope to convince you, across the spatial and computational realms to achieve scalable solutions for a variety of complex problems. And for a lot of us, we love maps. We love mapping things out. But as I said earlier, it is not just about the understanding of patterns, but it's what's driving the changes of patterns. So this is between the process and the models. Uh, and the changes of the patterns, the processes, models are contributing to. So this is a recent study I was helping with, serving on this National Science uh, Academy of Sciences Committee, sponsored by uh, NGA. National Geospatial Intelligence Agency was released last year. Uh, so the idea is uh, it's time now for data and model interactions to happen in a more scientifically sound fashion so that we could move beyond maps into models and link maps and models more synergistically. So Ross and I, ha and I have an overlap in this particular example uh, the person who led this work is Wen Wu Tang, worked with both Ross and me in the past. Uh, Wen Wu did this very uh, creative model. The idea is if we evaluate geospatial models, a variety of geospatial models have inherent parallelism. You know, you look at a vegetation change, urbanization. These things are not happening in isolated fashion. They are happening in parallel. But uh, for multiple decades of GIS, geospatial technologies and science evolution, we twisted our arms to develop geospatial models based on sequential computing without explicit consideration of such parallelism. Now the time has come. We have the parallel computing, distributed computing as mainstream that allows us to characterize parallelism and concurrency of geospatial models by nature, not just for computational performance purpose, but by modeling the concurrency and parallelism directly, and then implement on parallel high-performance computers. That is, to me, a tremendously exciting scientific opportunity because of the computing architecture naturally supports the representation of your models and explicit capture of the parallelism in your models as opposed to in the past we all always implement a lot of things and then squeeze them serialized into sequential computing execution. Now I suggest we think differently. And when we came up with a graph based model to capture parallelism across processes and map such parallelism representation directly into a computing environment, high performance computing environment. So if you do this systematically, I tend to believe you have a better opportunity to pose 
science questions in innovative fashion and achieve such big geospatial simulation. And in this case, uh, Eric Shook uh, was a PhD student I advised now is at Minnesota junior faculty, developed his own career. But what he did was this uh, continental scale uh, disease spread model that assembles population movement and disease model and interaction model across people, but at the individual level. And if you do this across the entire US, and Eric once told me he ran the model once and he produced 30 terabytes data. So I said, Eric, could you create a map so that I see the patterns of your analysis out of the runs? And Eric said, no, no, I have to do a Monte Carlo. I need to run hundreds of times so that I could average give you statistical significance assessment. So could you give me some GIS tools I could do this analysis for such a run? So my point is, as we see the power of computing is increasing, the big compute power is also a big contributor of big data being produced. You get high fidelity, high resolution models that in turn produces lots of lots of data, demand analytical insights. Again, the conventional GIS we inherited is nowhere near to this kind of scenarios we need insights from and we need solutions to. So the good news is there is tremendous progress made in advanced computing and cyber infrastructure. And for instance, this was uh, part of uh, a report NSF was leading and uh, Dan Atkins was the lead author showing the importance of cyber infrastructure, uh, making analogy to other kinds of infrastructure. Since then, in the US, uh, NSF in particular has continued to play leadership roles in the evolution, development, innovation of advanced cyber infrastructure. I believe this is going to be a very major piece of the puzzle for future science and engineering. And we see from the geospatial domains, not only we are demanding the capabilities of cyber infrastructure and computing, but also we could contribute to the innovation of computing from geospatial point of view. If you consider the geospatial applications, we normally expect a great deal of interactivity, right? When I put maps ahead of me, I want to see the results. And I expect the results are coming back pretty quickly so that I could explore my patterns. This is not a typical case if you are familiar with high performance computing. Usually other scientific communities run big jobs for hours and get their results back for pro post processing. So in our case, we expect on demand computing and uh, our scientific workflows are oftentimes data-driven, whereas a lot of other science domains, there are equations, numerical experiments. And we also need our workflows to be scalable both in terms of data processing as well as in the simulation part. So if you consider all these requirements, there's actually no existing computing system could satisfy. And then we made this case to National Science Foundation say, hey, there's an opportunity for innovate computing infrastructure that considers all these requirements, but put a spatial in the center of the innovation. So um, two years ago, roughly, we started this uh, experiment, and it's called Roger, resource and geospatial, open geospatial education and research. So it's very much data driven, got six petabytes raw storage. Uh, a great deal of that is based on solid state drives. So it's fast data access. It has a common file system cuts across the traditional HPC environment, uh, GPFS. If you're sensitive to this terminology, follow me. If not, feel free to ask me questions afterwards. Uh, and also Hadoop, uh, file system. 
uh, allows the simulation and the data analytics to come together. There's also third computing modality is based on cloud OpenStack Docker. Again, this technical jargon, if uh, it's completely over you, uh, we could come back. But the idea is, is that the geospatial computing we see from cyber GIS is driving the innovation of the integration for all these computing modalities come together through a data-driven fashion. <coughs> and nicely, we ran a name competition. A person from Australia suggested we should use Roger as the name of the machine. And for those of you who are familiar with the history of GIS, Roger uh, Tomlinson's will respect as the father of GIS. So I was glad I could tweak the acronyms to exactly fit Roger uh, as, a, as a name for the machine. But uh, if you are curious about the technical aspect of this system, which we argue as the first geospatial supercomputer, this is the architecture. Again, a lot of technical jargons there. But at the bottom line is you have the basic computing modalities of different kinds that are integrated through cyber GIS software in different dimensions, which I'll tell you a bit more, and then driven by a variety of domain applications and sciences cases, including the hydrology example, and I'll mention a few other examples, for instance, in agriculture and, uh, and water resources, and also emergency management and so on. But uh, again, in case we have folks in the room are curious about this fundamental computing side, there is a traditional high-performance computing with the GPU, graphic processing unit, and the large memory nodes, and large storage, high bandwidth. This is networked all together, uh, but also on-demand virtualization. That is referred to as the cloud computing piece. So let's come back to CyberGIS, which I'll wrap up my talk around. Uh, 2008, I was writing my NSF career proposal. I was imagining in this big data time, which at that time not many people were calling, this is a big data time, it's only the beginning time, I was imagining what would be GIS looking like. So that was the picture I came up with, put into my proposal. I imagined GIS in the new time would be this integration across high-end computing big data to knowledge transformation, high fidelity visual analytics, visualization, and collaborative problem solving. And this need to be come together. And because of this integration centered on spatial, critical spatial computational thinking requires new research frontiers to emerge, highlighted across these onions you saw here. And 2010, we convinced the NSF based on this integration vision, you actually need to come up with a new software, which did not exist yet. So we assembled nine institutions, about 30 people say, hey, let's figure out what the software might look like. So these are the people, our active contributors. And the purpose of that project is to sort out a collaborative software framework encompassing many research fields, of course, geo and spatial critical lens, but it technically is to achieve seamless integration of advanced cyber infrastructure, GIS, spatial analysis, and modeling. This is to resolve big data, large volumes of data, complex spatial analysis modeling, empower high performance collaborative geospatial problem solving. But at that time, we realized there is this emergence of broad geospatial digital ecosystems. So it's not like just a few software packages would be everything people are dependent on. It's going to be very networked, interdependent services and capabilities out there it's growing exponentially. Grass, QGIS, everything. GDEL, you name it. It's just everywhere people are innovating and creating this digital ecosystem. And of course, our focus is the software because we see lots of geospatial discovery innovation opportunities are dependent on software, but uh, also, the advances of cyber infrastructure presenting new digital environments software have to be adapted to, right? Your conventional GIS algorithms, especially those based on sequential computing, are not 
working exploiting such new computing architecture and advanced cyber infrastructure resources, period, outdated. So we see three modalities of CyberGS software need to be innovated. One is what we call CyberGS Gateway. This is CyberGS for everybody, meaning you could access CyberGS analytics and data online with the customized interfaces to your applications and needs. And the CyberGS Toolkit, on the other hand, is for computational data scientists with a geospatial focus. So the toolkit is for those experts who are comfortable with algorithms and coding and programming to evolve that capability. And the middleware is for integrated access to cyber infrastructure resources, but presenting APIs and the libraries to link with toolkit and the gateway. So if you look at the middleware piece, you see multiple dimensions of the capabilities of such middleware from high performance computing to data visualization, as I mentioned, distributed analysis and collaboration and participation. But overall, we see this is high performance, distributed and collaborative if you look at the characteristics of the CyberGS software capabilities. Gateway, as I was showing you the hydrological analysis of terrain data, you see the Tau DIM, which is a software tool created by David Tarbolton from Utah State. He's the PI of HydroShare, the NSF HydroShare project. But you saw we got into Tau DEM, Tau DIM, to perform hydrological data analysis that is becoming a shared service online. A large number of users could access to that application simultaneously. And similarly, there are other applications. Again, you could access gateway.cybergs.org and register yourself from the top right corner, and you would be able to play with some of these applications. And this is fostering a global user community because we truly believe this capability needs to be broadly accessed for people to shrink the digital divide between the advanced digital capabilities and the geospatial tools and the support a lot of sciences and applications are dependent on. So right now, this map shows the distribution of the gateway user communities across the globe. Of course, mostly coming from the US, but you see some other parts of the world. In, in fact, five continents all has, has users uh, get on the gateway trying to figure out uh, you know, what you could do with, with the, some of the, the CyberGS analytics and also associated data. As I mentioned, the GISoft middleware is uh, mostly for API access. So if you are a CyberGS application expert, what would you use to create your own applications? So these are the APIs. Many of them are based on REST web services you could call to create your own application. So you don't have to become experts of big data and supercomputing to create your own CyberGS applications. So if you are familiar with such APIs, you should be able to create your regular applications that are CyberGS applications, just like you would create your GIS applications. And the toolkit is a, a open source repository. Uh, again, these are largely parallel scalable codes. You might need a computing cluster to play with these toys. Uh, but if you are already doing that, you should consider also contribute your code to this environment because we want to promote this community. We believe increasingly in the future that conventional GIS algorithms need to move into these scalable computing environments. And that needs to happen based on the computational data science progress we make in the geospatial context. And we work with the industry closely. And this is, in fact, a diagram created by ASRI folks. They see the complementarity and the synergy between, for instance, ArcGIS online environment and the CyberGIS gateway I was describing to you. Of course, we access ArcGIS online. For instance, the data we created from the CyberGIS gateway application could be published on, Cyber G uh, on ArcGIS online. And ArcGIS online could initiate their modeling analytics on the CyberGIS gateway. And these are all based on 
service calls, APIs. So uh, I mentioned a number of dimensions related to CyberGIS. This is you know, science and technology, engineering. Uh, but I want to go back to the science part. And for a while, we, in GI science, we focused primarily on the science of geographic information. Now, in the era of cyber GIS, that gets expanded substantially. This is not only just science of geographic information. This is science of geospatial data. This is science of geospatial computation. And this is the science of complex geospatial digital ecosystems. And I mentioned reproducibility, which is now a huge challenge in computational data sciences. When you analyze big data, you publish your results, how could I verify what you do? And uh, similarly, the reliability and, uh, and also validity of such kind of scientific approaches, it's all up in the air. So that's why it's so exciting in this time, because we see a new landscape emerging. We need completely new rethinking of what's going on here. And the cyber GIS essentially is just an element in this broad landscape that has deep roots in the geospatial context. But I see cyber GIS could also have broad implications in other sciences and technologies. And of course, this has emerged not only just as basic science research, but also as innovation and technologies. You know, for example, this special issue summarizes some of the technical progress made along the, the GI, cyber GIS development. Even back in 2011, when we saw this is coming, there was a special issue and a feature uh, done uh, on PNNS, uh, Don Wright. And I coordinated this. Uh, Don Wright now is chief scientist of uh, ASRI. Uh, but since then, a lot of things have happened. And one example here, for instance, is how could you assemble multi-decade weather crop data, uh, climate data, to understand the impact of climate variables, variability on the change of crop yields? So these kind of questions were only approachable, say, five years ago at the laboratory scale. People monitor plants and try to figure out the climate variables have particular impact on the growth of plants. Now, because of the availability of geospatial data, because of the ability you could put them together across decades, you are now able to ask the questions at this scale. So this is my point is cyber GIS is also about our ability of posing new questions and addressing some very complex science problems. Otherwise, we would not even be imagining. And it's not only just about the physical sciences, biological sciences. It's also about social dynamics and environments. So in this case, we are analyzing social unrests and also human mobilities uh, you know, based on unconventional geospatial data, not you know, very precise measurements necessarily, but rather humans are leaving traces across space and time and what that means to social dynamics. And in order to do that, you clearly need intelligent methodologies, get rid of the noises, but uh, combine the space, time, and the people representations together. If I would ask you, the existing GIS has a such a data model? If you could give me, I would be very happy. But uh, the reality is the state of the art. We need innovation to come up with such models that cut across all these dimensions and enable analytics and knowledge discovery, which I think is a huge, huge, uh, exciting frontier. And another important direction I see for cyber GIS is to enable integrated food, energy, and water research. And again, here is a very much geospatially centered integration across data, computational, and spatial domains. And this, again, across spatial and temporal scales. And it's very much complex problem solving. And that's where CyberGIS 
need to be further innovated. So coming back to my vision, uh, I was hoping to share with you, and critical spatial thinking is crucial. And in this integration across four knowledge tiers, it has to go from the very top to the bottom. And of course, the digital transformation from the bottom to up. So now we're facing the challenges and opportunities of integration and the synthesis happening across from the very bottom to the top and at the top to the bottom. And this poses education challenges. How could someone get moving across those four freely? How could we train the people who could innovate across those four tiers? So NSF funded us to start this CyberGS Fellows Program. We got 13 institutions participating, come up with education materials, and sharing with each other. And we hope to disseminate those materials back to the communities for feedback and inviting further contributions. At UIUC, we've done a number of workshops covering the topics. Usually, you would not go into your conventional GIS curriculum. And we actually have a hard time to infuse such a thing into conventional GIS curriculum, because what would you take out? That's a simple question I would have to answer in my proposal to either new course or curriculum change. So we take a more agile approach to come up with workshops and hands-on sessions to allow us to get such topics covered. And uh, some of you, when I was visiting you earlier today, asked me about the summer school. Unfortunately, the school is closed. The application deadline has passed. I did see applicants from this school, so I'm pleased to, uh, to uh, recognize that. Um, so we have this very exciting first summer school uh, launched by UCGIS. As Ross mentioned, our community organization that will be hosted by the CyberGIS Center and the National Center for Supercomputing Applications this summer. So let me end with this grand opportunity we are all together facing. And this is a revolutionary discovery and innovation across many fields. But uh, our lens is through synergistic integration between CyberGIS and geospatial inspired computing and data sciences. I think we could do a lot more, and we are only starting. So with that, I want to acknowledge the funding sources. Uh, we are fortunate to have some longer-term support, because this kind of program requires longer-term focus. And of course, the community, uh, the people really behind this kind of vision. Uh, and uh, I'm very privileged to be able to uh, get into uh, this community, and then uh, I think we have a long way to go. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sean. We have about five minutes for questions. <laughs> I used even more time. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, yeah, that's really interesting stuff. Uh, when you were talking about uh, your computational intensity and things of that nature, and you had your graphic of pushing chunks of, of data out to different processes, it looked like you were using a Z curve. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what do you believe is well, okay, so based on your platform and the geospatial data structure, mm -hmm. it will apply either uh, an R tree or a quad tree. Mm -hmm. You are demonstrating a Z curve. Do you have a preference as to when working with big data, one indexing method versus another? Um, there are multiple schemes we have researched, um, but uh, including also other other spatial uh, space fitting curves like the Hilbert, uh, perhaps is more. Uh, favored in terms of preserving some spatial localities. Uh, but uh, in fact, for uh, quadri, uh the example I showed you is that one level, in fact, is a multi-level quadri. Uh, example, it's hard to give a cartoon to show how that is <laughs> passed around in different computing environments. Uh, the simple answer to your question is no. It's dependent on some data characteristics. Uh, some data characteristics, especially, for instance, uh, uh, polygonal data, uh, uh, you would uh, oftentimes want to employ R tree or variations of R trees. 
but for points, uh, generally quad tree be uh, working pretty well. Uh, and uh, for working with the quad trees, uh, Z curve is is quite effective. But uh, uh, in other variations of quad trees, uh, Hilbert curve might be better. So um, this spatial indexing dealing with the partitioning of space is highly dependent on. Currently, we have not figured out, you know, uniformly applicable solutions across the board. But we certainly have some general principles derived in terms of selecting different data uh, indexing and partitioning schemes. Uh, if you are interested in, uh, in some of the specifics, you can certainly get on offline uh, to, uh, to discuss more. Yep. <laughs> Helena, thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, I am wondering, uh, uh, we have been you know, uh, using HPC and we have seen uh, various modules from Graz being implemented in HPC mm -hmm. and one of the really big problems is that uh, as the technology changes and the platforms for HPC change, for example your Roger yeah. supercomputer will be replaced by some new technology. Yeah. The, the modules that were then adapted to this HPC device, uh, environment very often don't survive the release cycle. Mm -hmm. So there have been, so you said like we need a special, you know, approach for this HPC yeah. environment. But the question is, will this special approach be sustainable? Mm -hmm. How do you maintain the the modules that were specially designed for Roger? Yeah. so that they survive when a new technology comes, when there are new people, compared to when you have things on desktop, they yeah. will just get, there will be critical mass of people who will be mm -hmm. So what, yeah. what is your vision for keeping this essentially going? Right. Uh, very interesting question, um, because uh, right now I see we're still not having a critical mass. Uh, so to speak. Uh, technologies are changing fast. Uh, we certainly need to get to this critical mass, but uh, uh, of course there are a lot of different ways if we learn from other communities, for example, right? They, you know, the physical sciences, for, for instance, they've learned a lot to develop community-based uh, open source kind of codes uh, validated by communities in terms of the quality of the codes. I think in our communities, in our geospatial communities, uh, we've just started. We were spoiled uh, by personal computers. We thought that's it. It will grow forever, the performance uh, you could expect. But now that basically stopped, right? Uh, Moore's law came and we got the seeding. Um, so now the question is how do we quickly mobilize our talents and the workforce, recognize the critical importance of such uh, software and algorithm development. Uh, my argument is uh, we probably could learn from other communities, not necessarily always technology driven. Uh, I don't think that is an effective approach. Rather, is uh, 